Question oral, oral questions. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, we don't think of Canada as a country with mass grave sites. And because we don't, this week has changed us all. But we were warned they were there. Children disappeared from families without any closure of what happened to them. Will the government commit to urgent action on calls to action 71 to 76 from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report so that these families can have some closure? Honourable Prime Minister. Yes, Mr. Speaker. We have fully accepted all the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which includes working with Indigenous communities to locate their missing loved ones and their unmarked burial places in a culturally informed way. In 2019, we invested $33.8 million in this work and have been engaging with Indigenous communities impacted by residential schools on how best to proceed. We will continue to move forward, recognize the horror and the tragedy of the past, and fix the wrongs of the present in partnership with Indigenous peoples. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister in 2015 said he would move on all calls to action. This morning, the minister re-announced funding that was two years old. No new plan, no new resources, no sense of urgency. This week, Mr. Speaker, has changed the country. Canadians need to know that it has also changed the urgency with this government. Again, will the Prime Minister commit to announcing a plan to deliver on calls to action 71 to 76 dealing with missing children from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report by Canada Day. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, yes, we have been and we will continue to be. From 2015 onwards, we have taken this extraordinarily seriously and worked with uh, the partners uh, in Indigenous communities across the country on the important work of reconciliation. We accepted all the TRC recommendations uh, and calls to action, and we have been moving forward on them. We will continue to do that. We recognize the fresh urgency that non-Indigenous Canadians uh, are feeling because they are seeing this tragedy, which unfortunately is horrific and is terrible, but is not a tremendous surprise to many Indigenous families who've known this reality for far too long. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, what is not a tremendous surprise to families, Indigenous communities and many Canadians is that we hear nothing but talk in Ottawa, including from this Prime Minister who six years ago said he would move on all plans, Mr. Speaker. These children, the families, the communities deserve a precise and clear roadmap with funding and timelines to deliver on 71 to 76 calls to action dealing with these sites. If we're really going to embrace the country that is Canada, the Prime Minister needs to announce this before Canada Day. A honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, since 2019, we have been working on this issue with Indigenous communities, with Indigenous leadership, to make, for, make sure we're moving forward in a culturally appropriate, trauma-informed way. We understand uh, that there is uh, new uh, uh, urgency and pressures to move on this, and we will continue to invest uh, as much as is necessary to support communities on that path forward. Uh, but I will not take lessons from Conservatives on this. They were the ones that refused to give any money at all on this issue, refused one and a half million dollars uh, to help with this. We have been there and we will continue. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, through you, with respect to the Prime Minister, we all need to take lessons from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report. Here, here. The recommendations which six years ago the Prime Minister said he would act and deliver on, we have collectively not done that. I wrote to him on moving forward on C8, and I appreciate the effort to move that forward. But we need to show urgency now to give closure to these families and to Indigenous communities. It is not the time for political rhetoric in Ottawa, it's time to come together with a plan. 
Will the Prime Minister commit to delivering that plan to Canadians ahead of Canada Day? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as a government, we will continue to move forward on this reconciliation journey in partnership with Indigenous peoples. And that means, yes, moving forward on C8. And I appreciate the Leader of the Opposition's support on that, but it also means moving forward on the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is still problematic for the Conservative Party. It means continuing to move forward on ending boil water advisories, which uh, we are working hard on and will continue to. It means continue to respect Indigenous languages and Indigenous Indigenous culture and fight systemic racism right across the country and do it at all orders of government. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, this morning the Minister re-announced funding from two years ago. No new plan, no new resources, lack of a feeling of urgency. Canadians want to know what the government will change once again. Will the Prime Minister commit to responding to the calls to action 71 to 76 of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission before Canada Day? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, unlike the Conservative Party, we have accepted all of the recommendations made by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We will continue to work in cooperation with Indigenous communities to find their lost loved ones and taking into consideration their culture. In 2019, we had invested $33.8 million in this effort and we opened dialogue with Indigenous communities affected by indig Indian residential schools to find ways forward for them. They will continue to be at the heart of everything that we do. The Honourable Member for Belleau et Chambly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 17 days ago, the current member for Laurier Saint Marie welcomed my proposal to restrict debate with regard to the Act to amend the Broadcasting Act. The goal is to pass the bill before the end of the session in order to protect the, this uh, content and creation on French content. Instead, the Prime Minister prefers to quarrel with the Conservatives, perhaps to ensure that C-10 is rejected and it won't be his fault. Uh, are the Liberals serious when they are, say they want to protect Canadian and Quebec artists and Francophones, among others? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the cultural sector and artists know full well that this government has always and will always be there for them and with them in order to support them, yes, in these difficult times during the pandemic, but also in an increasingly digitized world. We condemn the games the Conservatives are playing in committee to block the bill, and we will continue to move forward with the bill which will ensure the protection of our culture across the country, and we hope to pass the bill by the end of the session. The Honourable Member for Belleau Chambly. Oh, light of hope. Last week, the Prime Minister multiplied statements to recognize once and for all the Quebec nation unconditionally and as a nation whose only official language and common language is French. However, his attachment to French in Quebec has to have meaning that uh, we walk the talk. So C-10 is a measure that would also allow us to protect and promote French creators who are creating in French, the performers who are performing and singing in French. Does he not believe it's his duty to do everything possible, the Right Honourable Prime Minister? I want to thank the Bloc Québécois leader for recognizing the extent to which protection of the language is important for the Liberal Party and the government. And that is effectively what is in C10. There are also measures to protect culture, the French culture and French language and French expression in the artistic sector. That is exactly one of the reasons why we are working hard in order to move this bill forward, and we obviously condemn the fact that the Conservatives continue to block the bill. We will work with everybody in the House in order to get through this. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. The discovery of 215 Indigenous children at a 
former residential school has shocked the nation. It's another example of clear proof of the genocidal actions of Canada. But it's a moment where we need to move beyond condolences to clear action. How can this prime minister take reconciliation seriously when he is sending his lawyers to fight Indigenous kids in court? In fact, the next date is in two weeks. So my question directly to the prime minister, will he call off his lawyers? Will he stop fighting Indigenous kids in court? The right honourable prime minister. Mr. Speaker, as we've said many, many times, every single survivor deserves compensation. That is something this government is committed to. And we are working with communities, with families, with Indigenous leadership to move forward on the right way to get that support to them. Uh, and we also understand that on top of just compensation and supports, we need to end the problem. We need to create institutions and supports and culturally informed ways of moving forward to support these kids now and into the future. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. La découverte. The discovery of 215 Indigenous children at a former Indian residential school upset the country. It's yet another proof of the genocidal actions of Canada. We need concrete actions now. How can the Prime Minister take reconciliation seriously when he continues to take uh, Indian residential school survivors to court. So my question is this. Will he stop taking Indian residential school survivors to court? Yes or no? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the entire country is dealing with this very difficult tragedy uh, represented by the deaths of these children and the horrors of Indian residential schools. That is why we have recognized uh, with beyond a shadow of a doubt, that we must compensate children who were abused in our institutions. And the only issue is to work with the communities and families and leadership. We will do this in order to ensure not only that is compensation provided, that be, but that we will there to create institutional change to improve the lives of these children. For Wellington, Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, it's clear the government has failed to protect national security. It granted a scientist from China's military, Fei Yu Yen, of the People's Liberation Army, access to its Level 4 Winnipeg lab, where the world's most dangerous viruses and pathogens are handled. How did this individual get access to the lab, and will the Prime Minister ensure that no scientist from China's military is granted access again in the future? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we take very seriously the responsibilities around national security, which is why we work very closely uh, with uh, national security organizations like CSIS uh, and the Communication Security Establishment to ensure uh, that uh, people are protected and that people who have uh, the proper security clearances are the right people indeed. Uh, I cannot comment specifically on these uh, individuals in question, but I can assure you that every step of the way this government has and always will take national security with utmost uh, importance. Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, the government has failed to comply with two orders from committee asking for the production of documents related to this matter, orders that he himself supported while he was in opposition that he now opposes. The Prime Minister is accountable to this House. He came to office promising demo greater democratic oversight, promising open and accountable government. When will he respect this House and its committees and deliver the documents we are asking for related to these national security breaches at the Winnipeg Lab? Great. Great. Honourable Prime Minister. I find that a little rich, Mr. Speaker, coming from a member of the former government that refused to bring in national security oversight with a committee of parliamentarians, which is exactly what we did. That wasn't there when I was in opposition uh, under uh, a conservative government. That's why we brought in the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians that has the security clearances, that is able to look into issues of the highest delicacy, of the highest national security. There are two outstanding members on that committee from the Conservative Party, and we certainly hope that all parliamentarians will be able to look into these matters. The Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. 
Mr. Speaker, the National Security and Intelligence Committee is accountable to the Prime Minister, not the other way around. He appoints the members of that committee and they serve at his pleasure. He can block information to the committee, block its reports. When will the Prime Minister be accountable to this House and deliver the documents that we have been asking for? And when will he commit to cooperate with the U.S. investigation about the origins of the coronavirus that President Biden has ordered last week and ensure that government scientists in Winnipeg and their documents, including lab notes, are made available to U.S. investigators? We can all agree that national security issues should be dealt with by parliamentarians through the appropriate venue. This is exactly the kind of thing that the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians was created for. They should examine these issues. We created NSI COP to allow for proper security of uh, proper scrutiny of national security issues by parliamentarians from all parties. In regards uh, to the uh, Biden government's announcement uh, on investigations, we will, of course, completely support them. It's important to get the truth of the matter. The Honourable Member for Laurie Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, Speaker, we all recognize on this side of the House that asking questions about communist China and the pandemic is quite unfortunate, but it is essential. When we asked questions to the Prime Minister last week on this, the Prime Minister called us racist. It's beneath a Prime Minister to act like that. Uh, the next day, the President of the United States uh, launched an investigation by his intelligence services into the origins of the pandemic, and he said, and I quote, as part of that uh, report, I have asked for areas of further inquiry that may be required, including specific questions for China. Does the Prime Minister believe that the President is racist for asking questions about China? Is Biden a racist? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we have uh, asked for better answers from the international community and from China on the origins of this pandemic. We are working with our allies. We are working with the United States. We will continue to demand that uh, the World Health Organization continues to investigate further to really understand what has happened, who is responsible, and how we can, above all, prevent this from happening in the future. We will always be there to ask those difficult questions. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. That's interesting, Mr. Speaker, that the Prime Minister responds to difficult questions, but essential ones concerned what happened at the National Microbiology Lab in Winnipeg. Uh, a researcher with ties to the Chinese military and worked in the lab. Deadly viruses were sent from Winnipeg to Wuhan in communist China. After this shipment, two researchers who worked in Winnipeg were escorted out of the lab by the RCMP. Is the Prime Minister prepared to get to the bottom of the issue? It's essential for our national safety, security, yes or no? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as we've already said, these two individuals are no longer working at the Public Health Agency of Canada. We cannot make a comment due to our uh, due to privacy concerns and our obligations, but parliamentarians must be able to do a follow-up and ask questions, even on questions that are quite sensitive when it comes to national security. That is why we created uh, a special committee of parliamentarians that will have and has the ability to look at all of the elements, including the most sensitive issues. I recommend the member use that committee of parliamentarians in order to do a follow-up. That is that what it's for. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. It's interesting to see that the Prime Minister is saying we can't talk about it because the two individuals lost their jobs. At, in Winnipeg, but that's why, Mr. Speaker, we're asking the questions. We want to know why these people were escorted out by the RCMP when they left. And Mr. Speaker, these are sensitive but essential questions. Once again, can the Prime Minister at least commit to, in the future, no one with any ties with to the Communist Party or the Chinese military will have uh, the number level four security clearance? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, we are all in agreement to say that parliamentarians should be able to debate issues of national security where it is appropriate to do so. That is exactly why the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians, the NSI COP, was created. It should be able to look at this issue. We 
have created the committee so parliamentarians from all parties can examine issues of national security, including two excellent members of the Conservative Party of Canada who are doing important work on that committee. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Pierre Boucher, Les Patriotes Verchères. Mr. Speaker, everybody in Quebec was disgusted to learn that the gluttons in Air Canada gave themselves $20 million in bonuses while the company was depending on public funds to uh, survive. They needed $6 billion to survive, but they didn't deserve getting a bonus paid by taxpayers. Yesterday, I asked the government to take action. And the Quebecers won't accept this, Mr. Speaker. Will the Prime Minister retain the amounts for Air Canada until those gluttons have paid the money back? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, we all know that this crisis has hard hit workers in the airline sector. We are there to support them. We signed an agreement with Air Canada that, among other th things, limited uh, bonuses and uh, share purchases of executives. But even when they were negotiating those contracts with us, they were giving out uh, huge bonuses to their senior uh, officials. That was unacceptable. I hope that Air Canada will explain their decision and their reasoning to Canadians who are shocked by the choices that Air Canada has made. The Honourable Member for Pierre Boucher, Les Patriotes Verchères, Mr. Speaker, the government said in October that it would support Air Canada uh, but the first thing that the grifters at Air Canada decided to do was to pay themselves $20 million, knowing that they would get repaid with taxpayers' money. What were they doing at the same time? They were laying off 20,000 workers and refusing to pay back consumers for the airline tickets they had purchased. The government let them do it. Great champions. What will the Prime Minister do today to ensure that these grifters pay back the $20 million? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I understand full well the lack of ability to understand and the uh, shock of Canadians with regard to this news uh, that senior executives at Air Canada have an explanation to give to Canadians while many workers, in fact, were being laid off while people who were working, be it on the planes, mechanics uh, had to go through difficult experience, is the executives were giving themselves such great bonuses, and we all are waiting for uh, Air Canada to explain itself. Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rita Lakes. Today, the Canada-China Committee received more illegally redacted documents from this government. They also got a letter from the President of the Public Health Agency of Canada that included the government talking points. Canadians don't want talking points. They deserve answers. Why are they getting more black ink and more whiteout from this government? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we can all agree that parliamentarians deserve to be able to look into all sorts of different facets of uh, the, what the government does, including and particularly around issues of national security. When I was in opposition, Mr. Speaker, we weren't able to do that because the Conservative government had a secretive approach that refused any sort of oversight, which is why we brought in the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians that would allow parliamentarians from all parties to get the kinds of clearances involved to be able to follow up. That is the right venue for that level of transparency, and we hope the parliamentarians will use it. Well, member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes. Canadians send us here to get accountability from the government, and the Prime Minister is very careful in his words. That's a committee of parliamentarians, not a committee of parliament. A committee of parliament has legally ordered those documents that this government even saw fit to redact the lines for the media that were included in the package today. That's how far these Liberals will go to hide the truth from Canadians. So is the Prime Minister going to be voting today for the motion to have the documents handed over to the committee, or is he going to continue his cover-up?
Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Again, Mr. Speaker, these issues have come up. They came up many times when Stephen Harper uh, was uh, Prime Minister because on issues of national security, there was very little accountability. There was no oversight. There was no transparency. So we created a National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians on which seat members from all different parties who are uh, given security clearances so that they can look into the most sensitive issues around national security security and they have done extraordinary jobs and put out many important reports and that is exactly the way for all parties to get accountability and insight. The Honourable Member for Leeds Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. It doesn't sound like openness by default like this government promised us. It sounds like the Prime Minister should be charging Stephen Harper rent for living inside his head for the last six years. The documents show that this government refuses to answer very simple questions. We know that Dr. Fei Hu Yan was a Chinese national associated with the Chinese military. We know the students that were escorted from the lab were also reported to be Chinese nationals. Why is it that the passport of the two scientists that were walked out, all of a sudden, a national security concern. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we all understand that there are certain elements that confirm uh, th that are of a level of national security interest. And uh, governments deal with those around the world all the time. What Canada has finally done since 2015 is equip itself with the same kinds of oversight by elected parliamentarians that other countries have long had. We looked at the uh, ways that the UK and the US and others handle uh, sensitive national security issues, and we created a national security uh, organization, uh, committee of parliamentarians to do just that that is the oversight that we have provided. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Again, Speaker, allow me to educate the Prime Minister. The UK uses a committee of parliament, not a committee made up of parliamentarians that reports only to the Prime Minister. Let me offer a quote from the Chief of Special Pathogens at the lab in Winnipeg. Quote, historically, it's also been easier to obtain material from us as opposed to US labs. Well, don't worry. He's only talking about why China would ask Canada for the Ebola virus. This government's approach to China from the beginning has been incredibly naive. Is all that black ink just covering up this government's biggest national security failure? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, again. Issues of national security are of utmost importance to all Canadians, and that's why they elect parliamentarians to hold governments to account. But on the issues of national security, it is important that there be higher levels of clearance given to parliamentarians who can properly dig into it and ask all the right questions. That is why we move forward on creating a national security uh, committee uh, of parliamentarians so that they can do the excellent work that they have been doing over the past many years, including with uh, outstanding representation from the Conservative Party of Canada on that committee. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Today, the United Nations is calling for investigations into the deaths of Indigenous students at residential schools. Maybe because the United Nations doesn't have confidence in this government because of their lack of action. In over six years of being in government, this Prime Minister has only implemented a fraction of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. Maybe if this Prime Minister wasn't so busy fighting Indigenous kids in court and fighting Indigenous survivors of residential schools, he would have more time to fight, more time to implement the calls to action. When will the Prime Minister implement all 94 calls to action? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, when we came into office, we accepted all uh, the recommendations, all the calls to action by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and we have been working on moving forward on all of them, recognizing that a number of them are provincial's area of jurisdiction. One of them uh, is for the Vatican to do, but we have been moving forward in a strong way in partnership with Indigenous peoples on getting uh, these things done. It obviously takes time. I am impatient. Indigenous communities are impatient, but we are working together to get them done right, and we will continue to. Canada needs to to recognize the past, we need to act now to protect the future. Well, member for Burnaby South. Six years and a fraction of the calls to action being done is not moving forward in a strong way. 
There's been two years since the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls inquiry recommended calls for justice, put forward calls for justice. And the plan, there is no national plan to implement those. It's so bad that the Native Women's Association of Canada says we're going to have to come up with our own plan because they've cited that the Liberal government's approach has been toxic and dysfunctional. How can the Prime Minister claim to take reconciliation seriously when he continues to fail Indigenous women and girls? Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, when we took office in 2015, we launched the national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls after many years of inaction by all uh, different stripes of government. Uh, this is something that we've been committed to and something we continue to work with as we stand with survivors and families of missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, two-spirit and LGBT. QQIA people. Uh, in response to the first ever national public inquiry into this ongoing tragedy, we're working with provinces, territories, and Indigenous leaders, survivors, and families to ensure uh, that uh, Indigenous women, girls uh, are safe. We will continue to do that work in partnership with them. Honourable Member for Mississauga, Erin Mills. Mr. Speaker, it's 2021, and yet there are still those who would debate a woman's right to choose what happens to her own body. Today, we'll be voting on a Conservative MP's bill, C-233, that is yet another attempt to police women's bodies, an attack on women's autonomy over our bodies by the Conservatives. Canadian women need to know, will the Prime Minister stand against Bill C-233 and stand up for, the, for women's rights across our country? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for Mississauga, Erin Mills, for her question and for her leadership of uh, the Liberal Women's Caucus. Let me be clear. Women and women alone have the right to make decisions about their own bodies. It is disappointing, but not surprising, to see Conservative politicians try to open this debate once again for the seventh time since 2007. Our government will always defend a woman's right to choose. The Liberal caucus will be voting against this harmful attack on women's rights, and I encourage all parties to do the same. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Selkirk, Interlake Eastman. Mr. Speaker, Justice Fish's report on this Liberal government's failure to protect our women and men in uniform was scathing and to the point. He said sexual misconduct in Canada's military is rampant in 2021 as in 2015. This is a direct result of the Defence Minister's failure to follow the Prime Minister's 2015 mandate letter directing him to implement the recommendations of the Deschamps report. Why did the Prime Minister ignore the Deschamps report instead of standing up for victims in the Canadian Armed Forces? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, we know that our institutions are not living up to the needs of those who have experienced miscontact, including our military justice system. We have taken concrete actions to address this. We named Lieutenant General Jenny Carignan as the Chief of Processional Conduct and Culture. We appointed Louise Arbour to conduct an independent review of the treatment of sexual misconduct. And we will be immediately implementing dozens of recommendations for Morris Fish's review of the military justice system. These are just uh, some of the first steps. Uh, we know there is much more to do. Member for Selkirk, Interlake Eastman. More liberal dithering and delaying. Justice Fish's report yesterday and Justice Deschamps' report in 2015 clearly stated the Sexual Misconduct Response Centre had to be independent and outside national defence. After five years and two reports, the Liberal government now wants to rag the puck and wait for a third opinion from a third retired Supreme Court justice. Our soldiers, sailors and aviators have been calling on this government for results, not more reports. The Prime Minister's cover-up on sexual misconduct by our top generals has gotten so bad, his Liberal MPs are now obstructing the Defence Committee to stop its investigation. What is the Prime Minister trying to hide? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me be clear, as I have been from the very beginning. Every woman or man who serves in our armed forces or works uh, anywhere across the country deserves a safe work environment and deserves to be supported with the proper resources uh, if they ever need to come forward uh, to report allegate, to report misconduct uh, or misbehaviour. This is something that we have made uh, significant progress on over the years, but as we've seen recently, there is so much more to do. That is why we have taken strong steps to continue to move forward to make sure that we transform the culture of our military and demonstrate uh, proper support for all who serve. The Honourable Member for Silkirk, Interlake Eastman. All talk, no action. 
Justice Fish explicitly calls on this government to implement the Victim's Bill of Rights provisions in Bill C-77, a bill that was passed by this parliament two years ago this month and still hasn't been brought into force. He states that until those victim rights are put in place, sexual assault should not be investigated or prosecuted under the National Defense Act. Why has the Prime Minister dragged his feet for years and failed to implement the rights for victims of sexual assault so they can finally get justice in our armed forces? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, over the past number of years, we have taken significant steps uh, to improve the support for women and men in our military coming forward uh, with allegations of misconduct. But we know there is much more to do. That is why uh, we thank uh, uh, Justice Fish for his report, and we'll be moving forward immediately on a number of those recommendations. But why we have also uh, tasked both uh, Lieutenant General Carignan uh, to be able to be there to support right now uh, anyone who has issues, while at the same time we move forward uh, with uh, uh, actions by uh, Justice Arbour uh, to ensure we're changing the culture for good. The Honourable Member for Selkirk, Interlake, Eastman. I'm sure, Mr. Speaker, that report will just collect dust on the Prime Minister's desk like the last report. Justice Fish's explosive report states that only 25 percent of regular force members who were victims of sexual assault stated someone in authority found out about the crime, and 57 percent said no one in authority was even aware. The morale of our women and men in uniform is at an all-time low, and their trust in reporting sexual assault to the military is abysmal. The Prime Minister's fake feminist credentials are on trial. Will the Prime Minister immediately implement the Military Victims Bill, Bill of Rights and make the Sexual Misconduct Reporting Center truly, truly independent? Right. Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, this is why we move forward immediately with appointing Lieutenant General uh, Carignan uh, to be able to be uh, someone that people can turn to in the military to start to change right away. But we know that to change the culture of the military that has far too long tolerated uh, misogyny and sexual harassment and abuse, uh, we need to go deeper than that. That is why uh, the work that Justice Arbour is doing will be that transformative uh, uh, element necessary to change our military for the better and support the women and men who serve. Mr. Speaker, on Monday, the Minister of Justice apparently had technical problems and couldn't answer my questions about his generous donor's appointment to the Superior Court, which he had announced on Twitter. Today, I would therefore ask the Prime Minister if he will apologize for his minister and commit to ensuring that funding the Liberal Party is no longer or nor will ever be a criteria for judicial appointments. Will he clearly commit to that, the Right Honourable Prime Minister? That is not at all a criterion, Mr. Speaker. We've made significant reforms to the process in 2006 in order to address the gaps in the process. We've reinforced the role of cons advisory committees, which are independent when it comes to appointments to the bench, and we've implemented a more rigorous, open and responsible process that better reflects diversity. Our appointments are merit-based. They're also based on the expertise required and the expertise of each candidate. We've appointed highly, appoint highly qualified candidates and of various political affiliations. The Honourable Member for Nord. The process is not independent, and it won't ever be as long as the Prime Minister's office and his ministers get involved. It reminds us that his supposedly independent process is such that out of six judges appointed in New Brunswick in 2019, five were close to the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. Three of them had donated him personally, including the wife of his brother-in-law and his neighbor. Mr. Speaker, that's called cronyism, and it's become systemic. Will the Prime Minister finally make the judicial appointment process impartial, or is he going to continue to defend cronyism? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, when we came to power in 2015, we set up a more rigorous, open, responsible system that better reflects Canada's diversity for appointing judges of high caliber to our institutions. Appointments are always merit-based. They're also based on the needs of various benches, as well as on the expertise of various candidates. We are proud of those who have been appointed since the implementation of our system. 
who come from various backgrounds and various political affiliations. The Honorable Member for Richmond Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, in Bill C-10, the Liberals are attacking freedom of expression and net neutrality. On Monday, Liberal committee members voted against our motion to protect Canadians' freedom on social media. Can the Prime Minister tell us why he's so determined to give the CRTC more power to regulate the web and, in so doing, to attack the freedom of expression of thousands of Canadians? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we're all disappointed but not surprised to see the Conservatives attack the cultural sector yet again. Justice Canada's analysis confirmed that C-10 is in line with freedom of expression, which is protected by the Charter. Bill C-10 is intended to harmonize the rules for Canadian content creators and web giants and require the most powerful foreign broadcasters to provide information on their income to contribute financially to Canadian stories and content and to allow different audiences to discover our culture. It does not attack freedom of expression. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, this is what officials said. They clearly indicated that the removal of Section 4.1 allowed the CRTC to legislate content on social media, training applications, video games, websites, and even audiobooks. Former CRTC officials have called this a serious mistake. Experts in the field have denounced the liberal attempt to attack net neutrality. Thousands of Canadians have stood up to oppose this Liberal government takeover. Why won't the Prime Minister listen to good old common sense? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. The question is, why are the Conservatives continuing to attack the cultural sector and content creators and our artists and our musicians? It's inexplicable. These artists not only contribute to our identity and to our pride, they contribute a great deal to our economy. In a world that is ever more digital, web giants aren't doing their share to support content creators in Canada. That is why the cultural sector supports our bill and we are going to go forward. We hope that the Conservatives will stop blocking the help that's necessary for the cultural sector. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, it's depressing to hear the Prime Minister. The reality is that he demonstrates that he's against net neutrality. He's attacking freedom of expression of Canadians on social media and is seeking by all means to give more power to the CRTC. If he were sincere in his will to help artists across the country, he would have accepted our amendment on Monday. Is he the only person responsible for the failure of C-10? The Prime Minister, with his Minister of Heritage, are insisting on this. Why do they continue to head down this path? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, we hope the Conservatives will be more constructive at committee and not obstruct it as they are currently doing. Many stakeholders from creative industries have offered their complete support to this bill. We're going to continue to go forward on their behalf. When it comes to net neutrality, Bill C-10 intends to promote music, stories, and creative works of Canadians and does not impugn on the provision of Internet services and does not impugn on net neutrality. The Honourable Member for Bourassa. Président, cette semaine, eu le pla... Mr. Speaker, earlier this week, I was pleased to join the Minister of Small Business to launch the Black Entrepreneurship Loan Fund. This is unique. That means that black business owners and entrepreneurs can access loans up to $250,000 to start, grow, and expand their businesses. Can the Prime Minister explain how this fund fits into our government's approach to empowering black entrepreneurs and business owners? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, first of all, I want to thank the Honourable Member for Bourassa for his work to combat systemic racism.
The loan fund is just one of the three pillars of the Black Entrepreneurship Program that we launched last fall. Since then, we've contributed $400 million to this program to support the success of black entrepreneurs and business owners across Canada. We recognize that systemic racism is also present in the business world, and the launch of the loan fund is a step towards meaningful long-term change. Honourable Member for Lethbridge. With Bill C-10, the government will promote and demote content based on its level of Canadianness. Now, last week I asked the Prime Minister if he thought the film Ultimate Gretzky fit within this category of Canadian. He seemed to think so, and of course, most Canadians would also think so. I mean, after all, it's a film about a famous Canadian. It's largely filmed in Canada. But surprisingly, no, it's not. It's not Canadian. Does it make the cut? Odd. So, under Bill C-10, what exactly will make the cut, Mr. Prime Minister? I, I, I just want to remind the honourable members to place their questions through the speaker, not directly to each other. The, uh, the honourable member, the honourable, uh, right honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, Bill C-10 aims to level the playing field between creators and web giants. It requires big, powerful foreign streamers to provide information on their revenues in Canada, financially contribute to Canadian stories and music, and make it easier for individuals to discover our culture. That is part of what this government has always stood for, to defend Canadian creators, to defend Canadian content, to promote it the same way uh, Canada has for decades ensuring that there is a Canadian proportion on radio shows, uh, on, uh, on TV, uh, TV networks. It's something we've always done to protect Canadians and culture, and we will continue to. The Honourable Member for Lethbridge. Here. It's clear the Prime Minister just has zero clue as to what is in this bill and the consequences that it will have for creators in Canada. Right. Let's just try another one. Again, we're just, we're just having fun here. Canadian Bacon, it's a movie featuring all things Canada, stars our very own John Candy, a famous actor from Canada. Just curious, does the Prime Minister think that Canadian Bacon makes the cut? Yeah. Oh, honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I remember well that movie filled with uh, uh, quite horrible stereotypes about Canadians and Americans, and I won't pronounce on it because, you know what, we have a CRTC and we have uh, a system that has established very clear rules in order to protect Canadian content, Canadian creators. Uh, over the years, many artists have been able to succeed because Canadian radio plays a percentage of Canadian music, because Canadian networks have to put forward Canadian shows. It's it's something we've done to create a Canadian uh, media and uh, content creator uh, industry in this country. We will continue to do that even into a more digital The Honourable Member for Lethbridge. I'm not sure that it gets easier than this. I mean, I'm just asking some simple Canadian cultural questions to a Prime Minister who wants to protect Canadian culture. So I thought this was going to be pretty simple, but he's right. It's not considered Canadian content, which is interesting. Now, this is important because under Bill C-10, this government will instruct the CRTC to regulate what is Canadian and what is not, what makes the cut and what is out. Now, under the current stipulation, as we've explored, Ultimate Gretzky doesn't make it. Canadian bacon doesn't count. So again, what is Canadian enough to make the cut under Bill C-10? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. It's interesting because now we're seeing the Conservatives go into an area where uh, we've long suspected them of wanting to go. Uh, that idea that we shouldn't be supporting and protecting Canadian culture, that we shouldn't be uh, ensuring that Canadian artists can succeed, uh, particularly faced with the extraordinary weight of the American cultural industry. American, uh, Canadians, uh, are, certain Conservative Canadians are no doubt frustrated that uh, Canadian radio stations always play about one-third Canadian content, uh, that uh, Canadian TV networks have to put forward Canadian content. It's something that has created and supported Canadian artists that Conservatives don't support. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Kensal. Mr. Speaker, Access to health care is a big issue in my community of Cape Breton, Canso, with many of my constituents having trouble getting access to a family doctor. As we know, COVID-19 has put additional uh, pressure on health care systems across this country, and the federal government has stepped up to keep Canadians safe and healthy in these challenging times. Mr. Speaker, my constituents want to know that their government has their back. Can the Prime Minister update us on how the federal government 
is supporting health care in Nova Scotia. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, I want to thank the member for Cape Breton Canso for this important question and for his tremendous work on Can uh, for Canadians at the Health Committee. Every Canadian should be able to rely and have access to our health care systems no matter where they live. We provided $290 million to Nova Scotia through the Safe Restart Agreement, and this year Nova Scotia will receive over $1.1 billion through the Canada Health Transfer. We will keep working with Nova Scotia and other partners to keep Canadians safe and healthy during COVID-19 and beyond. We made a promise we'd have Canadians' backs, and that's exactly what we've done. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. The horrible discovery of 215 Indigenous kids demands action. That's what our Opposition Day motion lays out. So I'm asking the Prime Minister, will he support this motion, which lays out, one, that he stop taking Indigenous kids and residential school survivors to court. Two, that he implement all 94 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. That he support the residential school survivors with supports that they need and make sure that a table of progress report is put forward so that we know that progress is being made. Will the Prime Minister support our motion, yes or no? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, when we first came into office, we accepted all the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, uh, Commission, which is something that the Conservatives and the NDP criticized us heartily for. We have moved forward consistently on delivering on those. Uh, we have moved forward on funding new schools, new health systems, uh, in, uh, reg in settling land claims, in moving forward on self-government agreements, uh, on ending boil water advisories. But with all that we've done, we know there is so much more to do, and we look forward to working with all parliamentarians to continue to deliver as we walk towards reconciliation together.